All right, let's get our Bibles open today, and uh, we're going to go, let's see where I'm at. Nope, that's not the right one. We're going to Psalm 20, is where we're going to begin. Trust, trust. I, I am so excited about this series. I don't know how long it's going to go. I know that God just keeps giving me more and more to to say and to pray about. I got a lot of notes. I don't know how much of it to bring to you. Obviously not just today. This is introductory in nature today. But this series in my study for it has been both surprising and delightful. So with that, let's open up to this passage in Psalm chapter 20 or Psalm 20. And let's uh, read the Holy Word of God this morning, prayerfully and worshipfully. It reads, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They, meaning those who trust in chariots and horses, they are brought to their knees and fall. But we rise up and stand firm. Father, we thank you, God, for the reading of your word. And thank you, Lord, for the teaching of it. Not so much by me. I, I'm, of course, a, a vessel, I believe, that is yielded into your hand for this purpose. But I pray more than that, Lord, that you, by your Holy Spirit, would teach us and show us great and mighty things that we did not know. Lord, that you would reinforce the things that we do know and strengthen us, God, by the learning and the edification of your Spirit and your Word this morning. And to this end, I submit myself in Jesus' name. Amen. Those of you who know me, you've heard this before because I've mentioned it from the pulpit, but at one time I had a terrible, terrible fear of flying. It was paralyzing. And whenever I would get on a plane, of course Mary was very fearful too, you know, we'd have to get the bag out for her, you know, we just, <laughs> but, uh, but it was just awful. We, we had, had never done it. I, I did it once or when we had gotten married, we were on the plane flying down to Disney and I, for some reason I relaxed and I didn't think too much about it, but Something happened where I began to be very fearful of getting on a plane. And uh, one time in particular, I remember, and I was coming from somewhere, and I was on a plane from Chicago to Rhode Island, about a two-and-a-half-hour flight, which I was dreading. And I got on the plane, and of course, you know, the plane rolls down the runway, and I'm just kind of holding on here, and, and the, the thing takes off. And, you know, I, I hadn't done it maybe but just a couple of times. And I wasn't used to anything. And I'm, and I'm hearing these sounds. I heard like, oh, what's that? You know, is the engine on fire? You know, and the plane would bump a little bit like that. And he says, man, is everything okay? What did we hit? Did, we, did an engine go in this? And did a seagull go in the engine? You know, what's going on? I'm hearing all of this stuff. And uh, if you know anything, I'm a bit claustrophobic. So just being inside of that tube, and I'm thinking, you know, my thoughts are just racing about the fact that here I am in this piece of metal, you know, 35,000 feet in the air, flying at 500 miles an hour. And I couldn't get that thought out of my mind. And it's, a, it's an awful thing to feel like you're putting yourself or you're putting your very life into the hands of someone else. And you know that it's full of all kinds of human frailties. Why? Because we're human beings. The people who built that machine are human beings. They can make mistakes. The, the uh, you know, a wire could come on loose. There's so many moving parts, you know, that could come undone. The pilot is a human being. He could be tired. Maybe he was drinking or something, or maybe, you know, could be any number of things. Anything could go wrong at any moment. And, and so it just, it leaves you with this sense of, uh, you know, what, what am I going to do, you know, if this thing crashes? 
And then a guy comes on the, 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 uh, the speaker and he starts talking. He says, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our flight today. We're so glad to have you. We're going to be flying at, you know, such and such mile an hour. We're heading to Providence right now. And he, was, he sounded so chipper and he sounded so happy, you know. And, and I'm actually thinking to myself, how can he be so relaxed and so chipper and happy when we're all going to die? <laughs> I didn't get it, you know. I mean, I, to me, I thought everybody should be holding on for dear life, you know. Here we go again. Oh, this is no oh, awful, so awful. And what I was doing was I was demonstrating what a lack of trust, trust looks like when your life is on the line and you're trusting in horses and chariots. You're trusting in the arm of the flesh. You're trusting in your own ability to control when you can't control. Trusting when you, and that's no ability at all. Or your, your, your ability to kind of reason and figure it out, you know. And the last thing I wanted in that moment was to be brought down, brought to my knees, and to fall to the ground inside of an airplane. How many of you have ever had any kind of irrational fear like that where, you know, okay, some of you are very brave people. Wow, that's wonderful. <laughs> Some people, you know, sometimes it's just little simple things that just get in there and whatever it is, but for whatever, especially when you're putting your, your life into the hands of someone else and your life depends on what they do for good or not so good. So we're beginning a new series and this topic came to me through much prayer and it was confirmed when I was on the phone the other day with, uh, with Tiffany Lynch and by the way, we totally forgot to pray for Uncle Ross this morning who's been, uh, you know, really battling some things in the hospital. Totally uh, slipped my mind, and I apologize for that. And we're going to stop and pray for him right now. He's, he's, he, had a, uh, he had a fall, and he's in uh, uh, rehabilitation. Uh, but uh, it was, you know, he had to go to the hospital, and he's been there for some time now. I just want to stop and lift him up. Lord, we just pray, God, for Uncle Ross. We thank you, God, that... Uh, even though he's battling this cancer, Lord, he's had some uh, uh, good turnaround with that and that you've been uh, watching over him, Lord. And Lord, he was with, in good spirits, Lord, when I visited him the other day. And, and I thank you, God, for that. And I pray, Father, that you would reach him and touch him, Father, powerfully by your spirit right now. In Jesus' wonderful and matchless name, amen. Amen. And I'm so glad I remembered because I talked with Tiffany about that, and it was during that conversation that she talked about, she said the word, God is trustworthy. I said, you know, that is exactly, and she says, yeah, that is my, our theme for this year is God gave us the word trust. And I said, Tiffany, do you know that that's what I'm going to be preaching on for the next two months? So, I mean, it's like a tremendous confirmation of what God is doing here. Today, we're going to be talking about the anatomy of trust. What is it that goes into making trust what it is? All of the various nuances, how it's different from faith, how it's the same uh, maybe in some ways, but how it overlaps. These are nuances that we sometimes don't see, but it makes a lot of difference in our understanding of it. So then we're going to be doing that today. So anyway, to finish my story, <clears throat> several years later, when I was still very fearful about planes, I was a little better by that time, but it was still quite an ordeal whenever it was it was time to get on a plane and fly. And, um, and I'll never forget that day because the date is etched into my mind forever. It was September 11th, 2001. How many of you know that date? That was the day... And I didn't realize it until two weeks later when I got on a plane, but that was the day when all of my fear of flying totally left and was completely gone. I had no more fear of flying after September 11th, 2001. And two weeks later when my wife and I got onto the plane, we, we just sat there and we enjoyed the ride all the way down to Florida. And of course I thought about it. But it was interesting that this was, um, 
18 years ago now, I love turbulence. It rocks me to sleep, you know. You say, well, how did that happen? Well, Jesus said, do not fear what men can do to you. And that was really big in my mind. In fact, I was a little bit angry. In fact, quite a bit angry. And something was resolved in me that went something like this. I will not be terrorized. And you know something? It's, when, it's at that point when all of my trusting in the things, you know, or trying to trust in the things, the good record of the airline, the fact that no plane has ever crashed coming or going from TF Green Airport. I tried that one. That, that worked. I tried to help other people with that who are going through the same things. doesn't work. But it really came down to the fact that I'm either going to fear men or trust in men or I'm going to trust God. And in trusting God and in looking to him and in knowing that it doesn't matter whether the, tr the plane goes down or not, I am in his hands and I'm going to trust him and I gave it all over to him and the fear left. The fear was gone. It always comes back to God. Now, I'm not saying that everybody else necessarily had that same experience or whether they should. It was just something that was very surprising to me and it happened just like that. Here's what that looks like. Look at Jeremiah chapter 17. We're going to look at verses 7 through 9. Jeremiah says, But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. And look at this. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear, speaking of the tree, the metaphor. We're like the metaphor. And the, it does not fear when the heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in the year of drought. It never fails to bear fruit. That's what trusting God and having confidence in him. Notice that all of that comes under the category of the fear of lack or the temptation to trust in the arm of the flesh, to trust in horses, to trust in chariots as it says. In, by the way, it says that in several places in the Old Testament. Chariots and horses were very important to their defense and to their military might and their ability to protect themselves. And so it's a perfect metaphor. But really, it means anything with regards to trusting even in ourselves. As we see here in verse 9, it adds this caveat. It says, the heart, your heart, not your physical heart, but that part of you that trusts, that part of you that we're always encouraged to follow. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? So in other words, Jeremiah is saying, we are either trusting and having confidence in God, and this will be the result of that, or we are trusting in the machinations of our own heart. And what he's saying is that we, we can't even understand our own heart. It's continually deceiving us. And feelings have that capacity. We're constantly in a place where feelings of fear, feelings of frustration, feelings of doubt, feeling all of these feelings that oftentimes go along with that part of our spiritual or uh, metaphysical anatomy, you know, the heart. It doesn't always tell the truth. It's interesting, isn't it? The question is, who can understand it? Well, none of us can, which is why we have to trust the word of the Lord and not the thoughts of our own mind. Not the ideas and the conclusions that we draw ourselves, especially if it's in contra uh, contrast to what the word of God tells us. Because when our confidence is in him, our roots will go deep. The water will flow, flow and just satiate the roots and provide greenness and everything else that is in health for your life. That's the nature of trust. 
And being free from the instability of trusting in yourself. Trusting in chariots and horses. Really comes down to the answer of one question. And that is this. Is God trustworthy? Like Tiffany said, God is trustworthy. That was a statement of faith. It's a statement of faith whenever it is that we say that from the heart. We say that understanding that his word is sufficient. And what happens when this question is answered in the affirmative is called a blessing. You know, is God trustworthy? Well, you're blessed. Why? Because you trust in the Lord whose confidence is in him. Your confidence is in him. Being trustworthy in the life of faith isn't based at all in trusting yourself. It's just the opposite. Trusting yourself is really nothing more than trusting in the arm of the flesh. And by default, you are not trusting God. It doesn't matter how competent or able we are. The basis of our trust must be continually and always. As much as it is possible to learn, to release, and to let go, to make yourself vulnerable and to take risk with God as you step out and follow him day to day, walking with him, talking with him. doesn't matter how capable we are. God is the one who must be our center. He must be the energizing center of our life. And it's through trust, as we're going to see, in a very specific way that this works Powerfully, Not only in our relationship with him, but our, in our relationship with everyone around us. It makes a huge difference. Paul David Tripp said this. He said, you can take your life off the shoulders, off your shoulders, because God has placed it on his. This doesn't mean that it doesn't matter how you live, but your security is not found in, the full, in your fullness, but in his. He can be trusted even when you cannot. He will be faithful and good even when you are not. He will do what is right and best even when you don't. And he is faithful to forgive you when convicting grace reveals how unfaithful you have been. Rather than giving you license to do whatever, this truth should give you motivation to continue. His grace calls you to invest in the one thing that will never come up short. And that one thing is the faithfulness of your God. God will remain faithful even when you are not. Because his faithfulness rests on who he is, not on what you do. And of course, Jesus modeled perfect trust perfectly. We see that. Even though in his nature, I mean, he was fully competent. It says in Philippians that he was in nature, he was fully God. Even in nature being in God. Yet, he laid down that divine prerogative in order to come as a human being, as a man into this earth and to live as a man. And in living as a man, and we find it repeatedly throughout the New Testament, in the words of Jesus himself, we see a complete and total trusting and dependency on God the Father. Hebrews 2, 11 and 13 says, So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. In the assembly I will sing praises. And again, this is Jesus speaking. I will put my trust in him. Who's he talking about? He's talking about the Father. Jesus himself, and for very good reason, modeled for us what it was to have trust in what it was the Lord was telling to the Father was telling him to do in each and what to say each and every moment. 
He said, I do nothing on my own, Jesus said, but only what I hear from him. And he trusted him. And he said, here am I and the children God has given me. What's that speaking? That's Jesus. He's come to the earth to make and to bring back a family unto himself, brothers and sisters, so that we also have a father. And having a father implies that we can trust him. You know, and I know a lot of people, they don't have very good experiences with their dad. And we, I understand that that can be a real problem. That what you've learned in your own family is not necessarily going to be a good example of the kind of familial love that the father has for you. And that's sometimes something that has to be learned. But you know what the wonderful thing is? The father is trustworthy. He will take you by the hand. He will lead you into green pastures. He will lead you through the valley of the shadow of death. You will fear no evil because your father, your heavenly father is faithful. And he loves you. And he will break down every morsel of that jaundice in your mind that has defiled you from understanding what a loving father is like and should be for those of you who have, who have gone through that. The scriptures reveal that everything Jesus did on earth was an expression of absolute trust in his father. Psalm 33, 4 says, The word of the Lord is correct, and everything he does is trustworthy. Everything he does is trustworthy. And Jesus knew his father was absolutely trustworthy. And trustworthy means that you're simply worthy of being trusted. You've proven that point of faithfulness. We see in Luke 23, verse 46, and of course this is, you know, an incredible time in the ministry of Jesus. He's at the very end of the very end. And these are his last words, his very last words before he dies. And what does he say? He says, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit or I entrust, is what he's saying there. I entrust my spirit, even in death, even when it came to that point. And he knew that it was his purpose to go to the cross and to carry the sins of the world and in, in substitute, take all of our badness upon himself and in exchange, because of what he did, it enabled him to be able to give us his righteousness, his goodness, even though we didn't deserve it. Even though we aren't trustworthy, he's trustworthy. Even though we have failed and we cannot in any way, there's no horse, there's no chariot, there's nothing that we can design on this earth that will make it possible for us to stand before a holy God and not be blamed except for the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from every sin. And he entrusted himself. It says, I into, into your hands I entrust my spirit. As his body was going to die, as he was going to go into the grave, and the Bible says that death could not hold him. Because he had never sinned. And on that third day, he rose again victoriously. But why? Because the Father raised him from the dead. Jesus didn't raise himself. The Bible says that by the Holy Spirit, he was raised. But it was the Father who raised him. He trusted him all the way. All the way. Every step. Through everything that came. Through every point of opposition. And through the very shadow of death, he was there. And Jesus was trusting his father. So when we trust in ourselves and ourselves fail, how many of you ever thought you were pretty cool with something and then you failed and found out you weren't so cool with it? <laughs> Every hand should be up on that one. <laughs> oh, my word. We can't go to God and complain as if he failed us because we never trusted him in the first place. Right? If we're trusting in ourselves and something goes wrong, well, what went wrong, God? What went wrong? Well, you didn't trust me. 
oh, I was trusting you. No, you were trusting in yourselves. You were trusting in horses. You were trusting in chariots. And interestingly, when we trust God, our definition of failure is completely removed. Because as long as you're trusting in yourself, you have a certain idea about how things have got to turn out in order to signal a win. But when you entrust yourself to God, you don't know what the win is. It might not be anything that you thought it was. God might have a completely different plan. And so your definition of the win goes away, and only God holds that now because you're trusting him. Isn't that right? Because the outcome is now in his hands, not ours. Even when it seems as though things are not going right, we trust in him. Though he slay me, Job said, I will trust. I will put my trust in him. You know, I found it interesting how little there is that is written on this subject compared to uh, the other primary biblical words. In my research, and even as I was, you know, going around through different places and looking at what people had to say about trust, uh, it was, by and large, it was very, very, you know, it was a lot about trusting Jesus, which is obviously what we're talking about today, which is the main thing. I mean, that's the foundation. But when looking at faith and grace and love and hope and joy, I mean, it was just so many different things. But I think what the, and I was thinking about this, and I think perhaps one of the reasons this might be is because a common belief or a common misunderstanding is that faith and trust are essentially the same thing. In fact, when you, when you study faith or when you study trust, you'll find a lot of times they keep using those words interchangeably as if they're the same thing. And they're not the same thing. So I think that the, maybe the assumption is that if, you know, you do a treatise on faith, well, you're covering trust at the same time because it's eventually, you know, essentially the same thing. And I don't think it is. So let's, uh, I want to just parse that, you know, break that out a little bit, and then we're going to close in just a moment here. But look at Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. Notice this. This is about faith. Hebrews 11 verse 1 defines faith. And so I think we can begin to see a little bit of a difference between trust and faith by looking at the specific definition of faith. Look at what it says here. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. In other words, there's something that you hope for, but it's not a vain wish. It's substantive. It's real. That hope is something that although you don't see it yet, in your place where you know there is substance that says yes. It becomes knowledge to you in that way. Anchoring faith that holds you steady you come to Christ and you have faith in Christ and it's that faith, that gift of faith that he gives you that doesn't give you a one-off emotional experience where you feel warm fuzzies for a few weeks and then you're gone. It holds you very tightly throughout your entire lifetime. You know, here I am 40-something years later from the day when I put my faith in Jesus Christ when I heard his word and I'm still walking with him. You know, we could say that about any one of us, you know. Why? Because faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. Whereas it could be said this way. I'm going to kind of use that same structural sentence here, and I want to talk about trust. Trust is the substance of things already revealed. It's the evidence of things clearly seen. I'll let that sit for a moment. Now, this is where it goes hand in hand with faith. Because faith is gift to, gifted to us by God so that all that has been revealed about him through the power of the message of the cross, the power of the gospel... It isn't just a historical record. 
It isn't just something that's in a, you know, a book that's just ink on paper. God accompanies the message of the gospel with his very Holy Spirit to open our heart and by faith to understand that this is, in fact, the track record of God. This, you know that you know that you know. It says when you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that's already happened. You know that because the story has been told. That your faith informs you of that. And then based on that, based on that historical record, based on what it was that God has done and how it is that he has revealed himself over and over and over again to be trustworthy, based on that faith, you're willing to trust him. You're willing to take risk in your life when it's appropriate, when he's moving you into places that, you know, seem like you're stepping out of the boat onto water. Peter believed in his heart that he was going to have a firm foundation when he stepped out of that boat. His faith informed him of that. But then it took trust in the fact that he said to come and that there was going to be substance under his foot. His track record, everything about him and everything that, that Peter saw told him that Jesus could be trusted and that he could do that and that he wouldn't sink. And he stepped out of the boat and he walked on the water. Faith in God's gift of absolute confidence. Let me put it this way. Faith is God's gift of absolute confidence that the things God said has happened or will happen even though we can't see it or understand it. Biblical trust is our gift back to God of absolute confidence in ordering our steps as a result of his track record of faithfulness. That's trust. We're going to find it's the same with our own relationships. We build a track record of, of things in our life that either make us trustworthy or not. It's based on our history. God made sure there was a history that was plainly seen. And notice this in Deuteronomy chapter 1. I'm going to ask the band to come. Deuteronomy 1, look at verse 29 through 32. Then I said to you, look at this. Do not be terrified. Do not be afraid of them, the Lord said. The Lord your God who is going before you will fight for you as he did for you in Egypt before your very eyes and in the wilderness. He says, there you saw. Notice this now. He's saying, there's something that happened. And he says, you saw it. You have a track record. You have something of an experience with me that shows you something about myself, is what he's saying. There you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a father carries his son all the way you went until you reached this place. He says, you remember that? And then he says, in spite of this, you did not trust in the Lord your God. So what is he saying there? See, God is so good in that he gave them every plausible reason to trust him. There was, a, there was a track record that was undeniable, and they knew it because they saw it with their own eyes. And the rebuke is, is coming. Not be, he didn't expect them to trust him in a vacuum. He didn't just show up and say something. No, what he did was he gave them everything they needed so that they were without excuse. With, with regard to trusting him. Do you see that? And this is, this is really what, what, for me, one of the most beautiful things that I've learned in my Christian walk in how to trust, how to, to step out there. And, you know, it's, it's hard sometimes because faith and trust are so, you know, they're so intertwined. But I think there's enough of a distance, difference here that even though it can become very nuanced, it can also become very life-giving. Powerful thing. Blessed is the Lord, the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. There'll be like a tree planted by the water who sends out its roots and its stream. Look at this. Look at this great, uh, you know, steadfastness and this 
flourishing life that comes out of trusting God. It does not fear when the heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in the year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Why? Because the Lord can say, based on what you know about me, I'm telling you now, this is what I want you to do. Trust me. How do you know about him? Because he makes sure by the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit informs you by faith that it is substantive, real. It's not some, you know, story that's made up. It's not a fairy tale. It's not a myth. No, the Spirit of God makes sure that you know by opening your eyes, it says, as he opened the heart of Lydia and gave her understanding, God, through the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, when he opens your eyes and he gives you that substance, now you have every reason to trust him. And yes, you trust him for salvation, obviously. But you're saved by faith. Well, anyway, that's the introduction. Let's pause for prayer. Father, thank you. Thank you, God, for graciously meeting us this morning here in this place. Thank you, Lord, that you don't leave us to our own devices, but that you order our steps. Lord, that you grant unto us to know what it is that is important in life. You show us by your mercy, day by day, how it is that you are shepherding us and leading us, leading us into green pastures and still waters and through the valley of the shadow of death. And Lord, as we take each step, we learn more and more what it means to trust you because with each step we take and with each season in our life where you have shown yourself faithful, it just becomes more and more of that personal track record where we can look back over the landscape of our life and see what you have done and say, God is good. God is great. He is trustworthy. He is worthy of being trusted. There is not one point where he will ever fail. Whether or not we understand it or believe it, it doesn't matter. Um, well, God is working in our life. That's the most important thing we need to take away from this today, and that he is working in such a way so that we can take steps. Father, thank you, God, for that step this morning, that you've placed our foot in the direction, God, where you would have us go, and that it requires, Lord, that we trust that you will accomplish the thing that you began in our life. And so I thank you for that. Thank you for all of the people here and for your blessing on each one. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.